Hi, I'm Jay Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader. And we're here again to talk about another episode of the 1950s TV anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. I've written about the shows like this for magazines like Cult Movies and Starlog, and Film Facts, and the San Diego Reader published an in-depth history of this program I wrote a while back. That article included several taped interviews I conducted over 30 years ago with the show creators, and you're going to be able to hear some of those on the commentary tracks for some of the other episodes. So I open this, uh, th this episode with uh, a sign that tells everyone basically what the premise of our story is, as well as the title. Uh, this is the 19th episode of Tales of Tomorrow. It's called What You Need. Uh, it was broadcast live as it was performed on the East Coast on February 8th, 1952. And the Kinescope version aired on the West Coast a couple weeks later on February 22nd. The story itself is about a shop owner who, as we saw the sign out front, announces, I have what you need. And uh, what we're going to find out is that the owner is using a fortune-telling machine that he invented. And it enables him to give customers exactly what they'll need as soon as they'll need it, or right before something momentous happens in their lives. And uh, if that sounds familiar, you probably would see s several similarities between that storyline and Stephen King's much later story, Needful Things. Well, the original story, What You Need, is uh, first appeared in the October 1945 issue of Astounding Magazine. And uh, you may already be familiar with the story from a much later Twilight Zone episode, which adapted it seven years later, in 1959. The original story is by Henry Cutner and his wife and writing partner, Catherine Lucille Moore, more commonly known as C.L. Moore. And they wrote together under a pseudonym, Lewis Paget, uh, and, and that was the pseudonym they used for this story. The two of them actually met at the suggestion of one of Cutner's friends, H.P. Lovecraft, of all people. Um, one of their short stories, The Twonky, was made into a very strange little science fiction film in 1953 about a walking, talking TV set. Uh, and something a little more contemporary, the 2007 film, The Last Mimsy, based on one of their stories. Uh, the year before this uh, aired, in 1951, Tales of Tomorrow uh, adapted one of his stories called The Dark Angel. So... Cutner's stories were adapted for a few other TV anthologies that were well suited for shows like Lights Out uh, in 1951. Uh, he also did the Masquerade episode of Boris Karloff's Thriller, the story that that was based on uh, in 1961. That was one of the few comedic episodes of the show uh, with Elizabeth Montgomery and Tom Poston. His story was also the basis for a 1958 TV pilot called Tales of Frankenstein. And Cutner's story, The Graveyard Rats, was adapted for the 1996 Trilogy of Terror 2 TV movie uh, by Richard Matheson and Dan Curtis, following up their, their famous and wonderful 1970s TV movie. So, our main character here that we're seeing, he's a freelance writer uh, with very few job prospects. He, he's basically a reporter who, who doesn't get too many jobs. And he's noticed that this little curio shop is very popular, and he's been outside taking notes about it. He, he notices wealthy people that are going in and out, and uh, he's gone in here and he's kind of angrily confronting the owner and his wife, and basically reveals himself right from the get-go to be a, a fairly uh, disagreeable fellow who probably deserves to be as underemployed as he turns out to be. So our belligerent writer here, he sees people have been paying thousands of dollars for uh, really strange common items like plastic gloves, an egg, uh, a test tube vial, uh, and one guy comes in, he pays $5,000 and uh, e ends up holding a gun in his hand when he leaves. So this raises this reporter's red flags. And in the Twilight Zone version, it, it, it's somewhat different. The shop owner in that one is changed to, uh, he's like a little old man who goes around with a vending tray. And, and it magically materializes exactly what his customers need at any given time. Wh which, if you think about it, really kind of removes the story from the realm of science fiction as we have here, because uh, what this fellow is using is an actual scientifically devised machine that uh, we'll see shortly hidden in the back room. And it's programmed to tell the future, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, an early version of a computer algorithm. But the Twilight Zone version is a, really more of a, a monkey's paw style uh, horror fantasy uh, that, that really is more about the danger of depending on magical solutions rather uh, than what we have here, a science fiction warning that uh, you prevent something like an AI that predicts the future, and eventually uh, that invention is going to be 
uh, abused by the unscrupulous. And this, our lead character here, is certainly uh, an unscrupulous character. The old guy, uh, as we can see here, he doesn't want to give this guy what he needs. But he ends up kind of being bullied into something here. I'll, I'll tell you a little about the actor that's playing the shop owner. His name is Ed, Edgar Style. Uh, and he's he was a little guy, as you can see. He's said to be around five foot five, and he was really known for being great at doing various dialects and accents. Uh, you, you might remember he played the scientist Dr. Hauer in the original Buck Rogers in the 21st Century radio show. Uh, he did other radio shows too, like Gangbusters and uh, the Inner Sanctum series, which was kind of similar to this here. Uh, an anthology on the radio. He was the first actor to play Dr. Herman Einstein in the original Broadway production of Arsenic and Old Lace. And, uh, of course, he did all the uh, major TV anthologies at the time, uh, including uh, several of kind of early forerunners of the Twilight Zone like this program was. He, he did a show called The Web, actually two episodes of that I think he did in 1952. Uh, he did the Lights Out TV series, uh, also in 52. Uh, and all through 51 and 52, you could see him in several episodes of the TV series Suspense, which is another anthology thriller. And I think he did nine episodes of that. And uh, he, he kind of maintained his presence in science fiction and fantasy films. Later on, you can see him in uh, films like The 4D Man in 1959. Uh, and in 1961, he's in one called Atlantis, The Lost Continent. And uh, on TV which is where probably most people uh, are used to seeing his face. He'd go on to do all kinds of shows like One Step Beyond, uh, Perry Mason, The Man from Uncle, I Spy. Uh, there's an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents he's in called Listen, Listen. You might uh, probably remember him best from, from The Twilight Zone, a 1960 episode called Long Live Walter Jameson. And in that one he played Professor Sam Kittredge. And you can see Edgar Style in uh, other Tales of Tomorrow episodes besides What You Need. He was also in the, uh, it was The Crystal Egg. They adapted an H.G. Wells story. And he was also in The Cocoon uh, and The Invader. I think that was all of them. Um, so here is his, uh, his girlfriend or his wife. I'm not really sure if they uh, clarify who she is, but uh, she's uncredited. William Redfield, though who plays our, our, our reporter, who's having trouble selling stories. He was a one-time child actor, and he went on to become one of the original founders of the Actors Studio. And around a year after this show, which was in 1952, he actually landed a starring role in his own show in a short-lived 1953 series on the Dumont Network called Jimmy Hughes' Rookie Cop. Uh, and then in 1954, he started a one-season show called The Marriage, which, uh, I understand from looking it up, was the uh, first live network series to be broadcast weekly in color, apparently. Now, as a writer, he actually co-created a show called Mr. Peepers in 1952. It's very fondly remembered. Uh, he played Captain Bill Owens in the 1966 science fiction film uh, Fantastic Voyage. And uh, he was in the original Death Wish with Charles Bronson in 1975. Uh, also in 1975, he's Harding in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, he was that highly logical mental patient. So now we're at the newspaper office, and we just saw that's a real A.B. Dick mimeograph printing machine that uh, the editor is pulling off uh, a sheet from the proof proofread. I, I guess that's pretty, uh, their attempt at authenticity, although an actual newspaper printing press would probably be the size of that whole room there. Now the guy who plays Frank, the writer's editor, uh, he's uncredited also, but I can tell you that's actor Harry Clark, who'd go on to play Stanley Sawicki in the Phil Silver show from uh, around 55 and 56 he was on that. Uh, he also played one of the two gangsters in the original Broadway production of Kiss Me Kate. And shortly after this episode aired in 1952, he was in that TV show Mr. Peeper, as I mentioned, which uh, was co-created by none other than his co-star here, William Redfield. I guess they got along so good on this show, they immediately wanted to work together again. Uh, the actress who played Redfield's uh, wife or girlfriend, she's also uncredited. Uh, they didn't uh, credit the shopkeeper's wife either. I'm not sure why. It might have something to do with uh, how much the roles got paid, whether they got screen credit or not. Uh, in this episode, the only two who really get the uh, screen credit are, are two lead actors. So... Our writer for this episode is a fellow named Mel Goldberg. We've talked about him in a few other commentaries. 
Uh, he adapted it. Uh, well, well, his background for doing this kind of thing, he'd done shows like Hang 'em High, The Big Valley. Uh, well, he would go on to do shows like The Big Valley, rather, and Hawaii Five O. After Tales of Tomorrow, he wrote for a few similar anthologies like Suspense in 1952. He wrote for one called The Mask in 1954. And uh, he wrote for all the big anthologies like Studio One and Climax, Craft Theater, General Electric Theater. In 1960, he wrote an episode of Boris Karloff's thriller called Worse Than Murder, about a woman who uses a diary for blackmail. Uh, and there was a 74 anthology TV show called The Evil Touch. He scripted one of those called Death by Dreaming, and he scripted the Lost Island episode of The Six Million Dollar Man, shortly after which he retired. Uh, Mel wrote eight episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. He wrote Sneak Attack, which is a surprisingly prophetic story about armed drones that show up all over America and start exploding, part of a, an invasion attempt by a Russian-style enemy. Uh, he also wrote Test Flight, which like this episode, was directed by Charles S. Dubin. We'll talk about him more in a moment. And that one also accurately predicts 21st century events in the real world with a story about how corporate billionaires eventually become the ones who build rockets to take men into outer space because uh, they're more well-equipped and well-financed than governments to, to be able to pull that off. He also scripted the Tales of Tomorrow episodes Bound Together, The Children's Room, and Enemy Unknown. Uh, Mel Goldberg worked again with the same director here uh, from What You Need, uh, Charles S. Dubin, uh, the same guy from Test Flight, on one called The Search for the Flying Saucer. That was the Tales of Tomorrow episode that starred uh, comedic actor Jack Carter. Dubin and Goldberg also worked together on a Tales of Tomorrow episode adapting The Crystal Egg by H.G. Wells. Uh, and that starred Oscar winner Thomas Mitchell alongside the actor who plays our shop owner here that we're seeing again, Edgar Style. Uh, so together, Goldberg and Dubin were kind of the equivalent of Robert Block and uh, Douglas Hayes over at Boris Karloff's Thriller. They were the go-to duo who could be counted on uh, to work together seamlessly and, and kind of always bring their uh, A-game to the table. So we're actually back now with, uh, we're getting a look here we got to look at the old man's machine, and this is really where the story uh, squarely falls in the realm of science fiction rather than the fantasy version. Uh, it turns out the shop owner, he invented this fortune-telling machine himself, and uh, he used to be a scientist whose experiments involved using astrology and astrological signs to accurately predict the future. Uh, how uh, he and his wife ended up running this funky little curio shop is anyone's guess, but they make it clear right from the start uh, that... that he only uses the machine to help people, and ideally people who deserve that help, uh, unlike this guy here. I'm gonna actually, I'll read you a quote from the original short story uh, where the scientist uh, turned curio, curio shop owner says, quote, by turning a calibrated dial, I checked the possible futures, unquote. And I think they actually hint that the shop owner used the machine at one point uh, to invent a polio vaccine because one of his customers with polio needed it. And worth noting there is that the real polio vaccine was, vaccine was still a few years away. So uh, th this inventor was really apparently on to something. So I want to talk a little bit also about the director that we mentioned before, uh, Charles S. Dubin. He's also somebody that we've talked about in some other commentaries. He directed six episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. He also directed the Dark Angel episode, which is one of the many show episodes where women are portrayed as... Uh, at best, not to be trusted, and at worst, uh, capable of, of blowing up the world. Uh, that seemed to be a recurring theme in some of his stories, or, or some of the stories he directed, anyways. Durbin is probably best known for directing the beloved 1965 TV version of Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. That's the one that starred Leslie Ann Warren. Uh, but he also did a lot of TV staples like Hawaii Five-O and Kojak, uh, Murder, She Wrote, The Rockford Files, uh, Matlock, MASH actually uh, featured him behind the camera I think more than any other director. He did 44 episodes of that one I think. So to his beginning of his career was really fairly close to when this program aired. He'd been hired by ABC as an associate producer in 1950, having already been promoted to head director by the time he began working here for Tales of Tomorrow, which is just the following year. He rose up fairly quickly. In 1958, uh, he actually turned up on the Hollywood blacklist of suspected communist sympathizers 
as did uh, another Tales of Tomorrow uh, writer, a fellow named Alvin Sapinsley. Um, but uh, Charles S. Dubin refused to testify at the court hearings, and uh, as far as I know, I don't think he was ever cited for contempt. Uh, the hiccup in his career didn't seem to last all that long, because he did go on to direct TV anthologies like uh, Omnibus, he did westerns like The Big Valley, did The Virginian, uh, did the uh, TV series Lou Grant, uh, did an episode of the 60s Tarzan series, uh, did Super Train, I don't know if you remember that one from 1979, also directed several episodes of a primetime 1969 series called The New People, and that was launched on the strength of a pilot written by none other than Rod Serling. And that was a pretty wild premise. The New People was about a bunch of diverse teenagers who get stranded on a desert island. And uh, it's fully stocked with, uh, with, with supplies to live with because it was originally going to be used to test nuclear bombs and had been abandoned before that uh, purpose had been realized. So these kids from battling backgrounds, they have to form a new society together, this sort of utopian hippie commune. And uh, Charles S. Dubin directed five episodes of that series, including one called The Pied Piper of Pot that I've been in search of myself. Uh, Dubin directed another Tales of Tomorrow featuring a mystery object with futuristic and uh, potentially benevolent powers, uh, a doctor's medical kit from the future, which is central to a story called The Little Black Bag. Uh, and that story was adapted for Tales of Tomorrow in 1952 from a C.M. Cornbluth story that was also adapted later for Rod Serling's Night Gallery, uh, as well as for a British anthology called Out of the Unknown. So... I should also tell a little, a little bit about you know what's happening in the TV scene at this time too. When this show was airing, Tales of Tomorrow was really rarely mentioned in the press, uh, although some of the sci-fi press would mention it. There was a magazine called If, and editor Paul Fairman called it the best science fiction show by far on TV today. Uh, it wasn't a ratings blockbuster, blockbuster rather. I, I interviewed one of the program sponsor reps in the late 1980s, a fellow named Robert Lewin. And I'll read you one of his quotes about that. He said, quote, ABC did not get good ratings as a whole until the show Disneyland came along, unquote. And that would have been around October 1954. Uh, Robert Lewin is, is often credited, or maybe blamed, uh, for bringing Biz Disney rather to television. Uh, he worked on both Disneyland and the Mickey Mouse Club. And, uh, of course, the ABC lineup was... Uh, was definitely much weaker than CBS or NBC, as he noted. And he'd know, having gone on to enjoy a career that found him heading up programming at one time or another for all three of the major networks. So, around a year after this aired in 1953, when Tales of Tomorrow was still airing, ABC decided to try out a Tales of Tomorrow radio series, of all things, which launched on New Year's Day. They hired one of the same... Uh, producers from this show, a fellow named George Foley, is the associate producer in charge of adapting stories for that show. Uh, and they, much like this series, they adapted from magazines like Galaxy Science Fiction. The host of the radio version of Tales of Tomorrow was a fellow named Raymond Edward Johnson. He had also hosted the long-running Inner Sanctum radio series, uh, as well as a pilot for a similar program called Beyond the World, which is sometimes, if you look it up online, uh, mistakenly associated with Tales of Tomorrow. Uh, by virtue of him being involved with it, I assume. Um, so by February 1953, though, the end of the month, around the 26th, the Tales of Tomorrow radio series had already hopped networks, and uh, it, it kind of petered out its run. It ended on April 9th, 1953, after only 15 episodes. There was a later show called X-1 that was launched in 1955, uh, which also drew from some of the Galaxy science fiction stories, and they remade several of the Tales of Tomorrow radio episodes. Uh, episodes like The Stars Are the Sticks, uh, The Moon is Green, The Girls from Earth, and The Old Die Rich, all four from the Tales of Tomorrow radio series. Uh, there, was actually, there was also a, a Tales of Tomorrow book series, very briefly anyways. Was a, uh, I think there was a short-lived magazine. And... Quite a few years after this, actually, after the show was off the air, there was an author named David Houston, and he adapted several Tales of Tomorrow for a series of paperbacks named after the series, as well as writing full-length full, full -length novels based on episodes. Uh, I've seen a couple of those books online. There's one, there's Ice from Space, uh, and he wrote a book version of Substance X as well. 
So they, there was an awful lot of uh, other actors uh, who, who were on the show that became notable or fairly well known when they got there. Uh, well known Hollywood stars like uh, Veronica Lake appeared on it. Uh, and people are just up and coming that were uh, just about to become famous, like Paul Newman, James Dean, Lee J. Cobb, uh, Burgess Meredith is in a couple of them, uh, Raymond Burr, Jackie Cooper. I mean, the list is fairly endless. Roger DeCoven, Bruce Cabot, Darren McGavin, Gene Raymond. <laughs> I, won't, I won't bore you with this endless list, but... Uh, What's even more impressive, though, that I will kind of uh, lay on you is some of these writers, because the Science Fiction League of America that was formed to uh, provide the basis uh, for the story bank for this series, there was 12 science fiction writers that agreed to pool their stories together uh, for a total of over 3,000 potential scripts. And those authors included Theodore Sturgeon, who was one of the fellows who helped brainstorm the show, and uh, we also had Arthur C. Clarke was involved, C.M. Cornbluth, Stanley G. Weinbaum, Frederick Brown, and they even adapted classic stories. Uh, as we mentioned, H.G. Wells, they did Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, they did Oscar Wilde's Picture of Dorian Gray, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So we're, we're getting near the end here. We saw that uh, the, the, the old man did give the guy what he needed, but not what he needed uh, to live, but basically what he needed to die. He gave him a pair of slippery shoes. Uh, the original uh, ending of the short story version of this runs, well, up until that point, it runs fairly parallel. The ending uh, in the original story is, uh, I think he f falls? I forget, but in, uh, yeah, he did, he falls. And this one here, he gets hit by a car because the shoes were too slippery. And uh, we don't see the accident, we just hear it. Uh, in a scream, and then we see that aftermath with the driver saying that he never had a chance. And, uh, the guy slipped right in front of him like he was pushed. So the old shopkeeper here, he acts kind of upset at first, as does his wife, but I mean, ultimately, he doesn't seem all that broken up about any of it because uh, I'll read you actually a quote from the script here. His wife uh, complains that he could have given the creep what he needed to save him rather than what he needed to die. And, uh, and she tells him, quote, he was evil. But death is for God to decide. You had no right. <clears throat> well, he, he, it's kind of a, a punch to you know, make, make it extra evident that, yeah, well, he did have to do it. It turns out he reveals to her that the machine told him that in two weeks this creepy reporter would have killed the old man uh, and presumably her, too, stolen the machine and used it for his own ends, which would have uh, eventually brought about the ruin of many. So the old man rationalizes that he was not only saving himself from the murderer, um, but uh, the world from the murderer's greed and avarice, which are pretty typical of Tales of Tomorrow, the dim view of humanity. Uh, and, and also note that he smashes the machine here. Remember, he actually had a polio vaccine <laughs> a couple of years before one really existed in the real world. And yet, rather than take a chance that uh, another person would come and abuse this machine, uh, he destroys it because mankind is not to be trusted. And as we wrap up, that is the overarching theme of most episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. Mankind is not to be trusted. And we'll talk about that some more later.